Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. Great streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Come along through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name, when the sun is shining down on me. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, the pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, we gather together to worship the God who came to us in a human body so that our human bodies can someday be raised and come to Him, perfected and imperishable. Until then, we freely admit that we are sinners, children of God who still struggle with the corruption of our human nature. In Christ, however, we have been redeemed. By His life, death and resurrection he purchased our pardon so that through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and conf confidence so we begin our worship by examining ourselves and asking God's forgiveness for the sins that separate us from him we confess confess our sins to God our Father Holy God, we confess that we have not been perfect as you are perfect. We have sinned us to thought, word, and action by what we have done and by what we have loved undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts, nor have we loved others as you love us. Yet we are sorry for our sins and sincerely repent. We ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus, who suffered and died in our place so that we can have new lives and be forgiven, restored, and adopted children. Hear the good news. Because of his great love for us, God the Father sent Jesus into the world to purchase our pardon through the sacrifice of his own life, then rise from death to set us free. As a result, God extends grace to all who trust in him, forgiving and restoring us through his spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for your promises by which we know that all things will someday be made right in our world and in us. Give us strength and wisdom as we struggle to do your perfect will in our broken world and in our broken lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We want to respond to that good news of our forgiveness and the redemption we have in Christ by singing a, a hymn that uh, I don't know how familiar it is. We've done it a couple times here. It's called In You Is Gladness. Testament reading this morning comes to us from Isaiah, and as always, I have a story to tell. I was looking in my Bible at this verse, and I found somewhere in the last four or five decades, I penciled in a note, and it read something like this, um, I am a boat moored to a rock, and I can only drift as far as the tether. I really like that word picture. The Lord is our rock. I'm moored to Him. I sometimes drift with the wind, but He lets me only go so far. And I never lose that foundation, that rock. And to me, that's what this Old Testament reading, to me, that's what it, how it spoke to me. Well, let me just read this stuff. <laughs> Through His prophet, God reminds His people. But although they are afraid, he is the only true God, and they can trust his word. Now this is what the Lord says. Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me there is no God. Who then is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people. And what is yet to come? Yes, 
Let him foretell what will come. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim this and foretell it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. This is truly the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our responsive reading from Psalm 119. In this portion of Psalm 119, a long acrostic poem in praise of God's word is people respond to his love by vowing to obey his words. You are my portion, Lord. I have promised to obey your words. I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your love. At midnight, I rise to give you thanks for your righteous laws. I am a friend to all who fear you, to all who love the Lord who sees us. The earth is filled with your love, Lord. Teach me your decrees. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And our epistle from Romans 8. While we wait, along with creation, for God to end all evil, we are encouraged to trust that God helps us and is working for our good. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hopes that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the, the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. The hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We want to take a, a minute to reflect on those words of comfort that we just heard, and, and in doing so, we prepare our hearts for the reading of the gospel, and we want to do that this morning by singing together the hymn, uh, It Is Well With My Soul.
lesson for the adults uh, to come up and meet me up here in the grass. I'm going to ask your help with something. So this morning I, I brought this uh, banner thing that I found in the church, and I thought you guys could help me with uh, what the story is on this picture. So anybody, what's the story of this? Do you know? Yeah, let me know. Noah, Noah and the ark, right? And so I don't see Noah, but this big boat thing is an ark, kind of a special kind of ark, right? Because who was on this ark? Yeah, Parker? The animals and Noah's family, right? Yeah, we remember all the animals, and, and it was Noah. And why was he on this ark? Yeah, Amelia? Really? He was going to flood the whole world. So this ark was God's way of saving them. It took a long time for Noah to build this big boat. And then God had two of every type of animal come on board because he wanted to save the animals, too. And why was God going to flood the whole world? You know? Yes, all the people were turning away from him. In fact, the only person who really followed the true God was Noah. And, uh, and there was his wife and his three sons and their wives got to go on the ark. But nobody else believed Noah. Nobody else believed in the true God. The whole world had become really bad really naughty we would say so god had noah build this ark and noah because he believed god he built this ark even though 
he may have never seen the ocean. We don't know. He might have never seen rain, but he built the ark, and then the rain came down. Anybody know for how long? 21 days? Longer than that. 46 days? A little less than that. What's that? Not seven weeks? Nope. 40 days. 40 days it rained. And then after it rained, of course, everything was flooded. So they had to stay aboard the ark for 150 days until the water all went down. Can you imagine how it smelled in the bottom of that ark with all the things? <laughs> But they finally landed on this mountain and God had them uh, leave the ark. And the first thing that Noah did was he built an altar and he praised God. He had a worship service thanking God for saving them. And they were a little afraid, I think, to go away from the ark after that horrific, traumatic storm. And so God gave them a sign that he would never destroy the world again. Anybody know what the sign was? Yeah, Amelia, that line? The rainbow! Awesome! You guys all knew it, I know. So the rainbow was a sign that God would never destroy the world again by flood. Now, the thing that's interesting to me about that story is after the only righteous person who worshipped God was saved in this flood, did everybody continue to worship God after that and everybody was good and did only what God wanted them to do for the rest of history? No! No! And I mention that because sometimes we think, why doesn't God just get rid of all the bad people? Right? Have you ever thought that? And the answer is because all of us have this thing in us called sin. And we, we all do bad things sometimes, right? And the question is, do we, do we worship God or not? Do we, do we listen to him like Noah did? So I'm going to be talking a little bit about why doesn't God just get rid of all the bad things? Because if he did, then we wouldn't hurt, right? We wouldn't have suffering. We wouldn't have pain. And God will someday do that. But there's a reason why he's waiting for the right time, just like he was waiting until Noah got the ark built before he flooded. It would have been bad if he said, go build an ark, and the ne next day it started flooding, right? Mm -hmm. But he waited until the ark was built, until all the animals on board, because God is patient with us, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So, thanks for helping me with that story. We're going to pray, and then I'm going to give you a little reminder of God's promise to uh, Noah. Will you guys all pray after me? Dear God, Dear God. thank you. Thank you. For, saving us for saving us through Jesus, through Jesus. And, saving Noah, and saving Noah so we can know you better. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. amen. So the other day I found something I thought was cool, which is rainbow suckers <laughs> at the store. So if you guys want one of these, just raise your hand and I'll throw one at you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, too many of you to just pick your favorite today. Here you go. I'm gonna throw one to you. I'll get one for you guys. Hey, you know what? I have just enough today. Just enough for all of you. My final one. Yay! Grace gets one too. <laughs> All right, thanks you guys for coming up here and helping me. I appreciate it. You can go back to your seats now. I don't know, I may be handicapped if I'm not able to use both my hands to gesture. We'll see how this works. The wireless uh, isn't working, so. Our gospel reading this morning is taken from Matthew's account of Jesus' life, uh, the 13th chapter. We've been doing a reading, series of readings, uh, really, the, all summer long through Matthew's gospel and some of the teachings of Jesus. And because these are the words of Jesus, I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, 
Do you want us to go pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them into bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. Then he, Jesus, left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And an enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the word of our Lord. I invite you all to be seated. This past week, I read that mortality, the mortality rate in the United States, uh, where they predict, you know, how many people are going to die in a year and then they track it, has finally returned to normal, that is, to what would be expected. After three years of mortality being exceptionally high due to COVID, up, up as high as 30% higher than what you would normally expect. And that's good news, even if some of us are still passing COVID around that the mortality, the number of people dying from COVID, is, is not exceptionally high. And it reminded me that over the last couple of years, I've had this question come back again and again that people have asked me, and, and it turns out pretty much every pastor has been asked this question, and that is, Pastor, why did God send COVID? And uh, I actually looked up online to see what some of the you know in-print answers were, and whew, they were the same as mine, which is, there's no evidence God sent COVID. No evidence at all. Or for that matter, most of the natural disasters we suffer. There's no evidence that the things that we suffer from are have a specific purpose. Like, you know, the plagues that hit Egypt. We know there was a specific purpose to those, right? When Sodom and Gomorrah got destroyed, we know that there was a purpose to that. When the flood hit Noah, we know there was a purpose to that. But one of the things I've noticed about the scripture is you could tell an act of God from a natural disaster. And you know how you can tell? If it's an act of God, God always warns people first. He always warns people first because he doesn't want to hurt anyone. He doesn't want, even though he wants evil to be weeded out, he always wants to give people the opportunity to repent, to turn back to him. And that, I think, is a really essential understanding for us as Christians. One that often gets missed uh, if we're not reading the Bible carefully or if we're, we're uh, getting our, our theology from internet memes. And our text for today helps us to understand that, our, our story from Jesus. That one of the characteristics of God that you and I as his followers have to adopt if we're going to represent the true God is what I call prudent patience. That is, we're patient because it's the wise thing to do. I, I have to tell you, whenever I hear or read the word prudence, I always think of George H.W. Bush because he used it a lot, and I love that. Because it's a word that's kind of disappearing from our language, but it's a really helpful concept, which is the fact that we are called to do the wise thing, the smart thing, the long-term results thing, even if we don't fully understand it. And a lot of times that involves delayed gratification. It involves something that's an incredibly short supply, increasingly, which is patience. It means waiting for it, waiting for God to act in our case. And I wanna dig out four things that I think are key ideas in this parable 
that we do well to remember. In fact, I think it's essential for us to remember. And the first one is this. Not every evil is a punishment. Not every evil is a punishment. I know when we're, when we're children, we think that any time we're uncomfortable, any time we're in pain, any time our parents make us do something we don't want to do, we think we're being punished. Right? But as adults, we understand, at least I hope we do, that our role is not to make our children comfortable all the time or even happy all the time. Our role as parents is to grow them into maturity. And to grow them into maturity means that sometimes they're going to be uncomfortable. Sometimes maybe even in, in pain. Sometimes they're going to have to take medicine even though it tastes bad. Sometimes they're going to have to eat vegetables even though they taste bad. <laughs> sometimes we're going to have to limit their screen time even though they really want to watch more. Sometimes we're going to have to have them do chores so they learn some responsibility. Sometimes we're going to have them do homework so that they learn, period. And they may not like that, but that's our role as parents because our role is to grow them into maturity so that they can be responsible, joyful, <coughs> healthy adults. When my daughter was uh, three and four years old, she uh, suffered from repeated ear infections. We were living in a damp climate, and they were so painful, and they were so painful to walk through with her. And I, I remember one time we had gotten some uh, antibiotic from the doctor in tablet form, and she would not swallow it. She just wouldn't. She cried and gagged and screamed. So we got some liquid antibiotic from the doctor in her favorite flavor, bubble gum, of course, and she spit it out. <laughs> again and again. She wouldn't swallow it. And was I angry? No. I was sad. I was sad because she could have been over the ear infection three or four days faster than it turned out. But she just wouldn't swallow the medicine. She just wouldn't obey, submit, whatever you want to say. I wasn't angry. I was sad. And oftentimes when we disobey God, I don't think he's angry as much as he is sad. He's sad because we suffer the consequences of our sins so often because we think we know better than God. We, we just don't trust him. And we suffer the consequences of other people's sin because they don't trust him. And God wants us to turn back to him. That's why he allows consequences of sins and, and for some other reasons that I'll that I'll get to in a moment. God is interested, you see, in our maturity. And, and the scripture re reports this again and again. There, there's a favorite passage of mine in Hebrews chapter 12 where it says, in your struggle against sin, you've not yet shed your blood. So do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Endure hardship as discipline. God disciplines us for good so that we can share in his holiness. Other people might discipline us because they're angry or because they want to force us into their will. God desires that we become more like him, more holy, more free, more set apart. And that's what this parable is about, isn't it? The reason that the farmer doesn't have his servants pull up the crop is what? He wants it to grow into maturity. That's what he wants. He wants the crop to mature. And if they pulled out the weeds, uh, a lot of the plants would, would be pulled up and wouldn't grow into maturity. So it reminds us that not every evil is a punishment from God. The second thing I, I want to point out is not every problem has a purpose. I say that because, you know, people always say, well, there's a reason for everything. Well, technically, I'm sure that's true, but it's not always God's reason. It's not always a good reason. Sometimes the reason that we suffer is because God gave us free will, which in and of itself is a good thing. But we, for whatever reason, don't do it, and, and we suffer. Sometimes, as I said, it's because other people are not doing what they ought to do. And, and because of free will, they have the ability to hurt us. Sometimes it's just random evil in the world. Because, let's face it, ever since the fall, our DNA has been messed up. Our world has been messed up. Did you catch in the reading from Romans? that all creation suffered because Adam and Eve fell. It's not just humans. 
Although we certainly contribute a lot to the suffering of creation, you know, corruption and greed and pollution and all that. But all creation is out of balance because sin entered into the world. And so all creation, Paul says, is, is waiting for the day when the Lord will make things right, when the sons of God will be revealed, when God will perform this harvest. And in the meantime, since not every problem has a purpose, nonetheless, we believe that God is able to bring a purpose to our suffering in many cases. That is, he redeems our suffering. He gives value to things that are valueless. He can bring good out of things that are evil. Right? That, that's what Paul goes to in, in Romans. He said, you know, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. It's not, it's all good. Right? You hear that all the time. And I know what people mean. They mean, I'm not bothered by whatever just happened. But as Christians, frankly, we don't believe it's all good. The Bible is full of descriptions of it not being good. Right? It's just not all good. There are bad things that happen to us. There are random acts of evil that happen to us because this world is broken. Because the reality is it's not all God's either. When scripture talks about the prince of this world, guess what? It's not talking about God. It's talking about God's enemy who currently controls this world. Now, ultimately, God is in control of the universe. Ultimately, he will put an end to sin and evil and tears and suffering and pain. But he's waiting. And in the meantime, it's not all good because it's not all God's. In fact, if you want to define evil, evil is the absence of God. And sin is the absence of God's will. Uh, sin is actually an old archery term for the distance between the bullseye and where my arrow lands. And many times my sin is very great. That's what sin means. And, and it, it gets put into the English language to help us to understand this concept that sin is simply the distance between what God would like to be happening for us, what God would like us to be doing, and where we actually land. But that doesn't mean that God can't bring good out of even our evil, even our sin. This is what the gospel is about. That we can be honest about the fact that we're not perfect. We're not all shiny and happy and bad things happen in our lives. We can be honest about that because we know the Redeemer. We know the one who's able to bring good out of evil. In fact, that's the central story. That's the point of scripture, isn't it? That God sent his son to earth and people did evil to him. They betrayed him, they abandoned him, they beat him, they mocked him, they crucified him unjustly. And yet God used that to pay for our sin so that we can consider ourselves righteous, so that we can become God's children. And that's what makes it good. Not that it's all good, but in God, it's all redeemed. This past week, uh, Doug and Sue Schweitzer were telling me about a movie that they that they saw, and some of you may have seen it, it's called Breakthrough, anybody seen that? I hadn't seen it, but it's about a, a, a teenager who's a basketball standout, and he and his buddies go out on this lake that's frozen over, and they don't heed, of course, the warnings that the ice is probably too thin, and they break through the ice. And the two buddies are rescued uh, pretty immediately, but the central figure actually sinks to the bottom of the lake, and it's like 42 minutes before they're able to retrieve his body. Not as a rescue, but as a body recovery. But they decide to take him to the hospital and see if they can start his heart. And after 55 minutes, they restart his heart. And by the way, this is a true story. It's a movie that was based on a true story. And there's no certainty that he will regain brain function, right? As you know, the brain robbed of oxygen uh, tends to suffer irreparable damage. But his parents, who are devout Christian believers, pray earnestly for him and, and ask that everyone pray for him. And just a few days later, he walked out of the hospital. And he went on to continue to play as a basketball standout, but with a bit more humility, with a bit more sense that he needed other people. And the greatest part of this story is that one of the paramedics who didn't believe in God at all, through this experience, 
having been led by a voice that he didn't realize wasn't a human voice, to search where he found the body, is led to believe that, yes, there is, in fact, a God. That's a story of redemption. That's our story. That's the story of all humanity in Christ. That God is able to bring good out of even the, the evil that we cause, that we do to ourselves, let alone the evil that other people do to us and the evil that happens to us just because our, our DNA is messed up. So not every problem has a purpose, but God is able to bring purpose to our problems. And the reason for that, I, I want to point out this, this third thing from this parable that's so clear is that God wants no one to be to perish. While you're pulling the weeds, he says to his workers, you may root up the wheat with it. And I think this is the basis for something that, that Peter, Jesus' disciple, writes later on in his letter where he says, Dear friends, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, at least not as some understand slowness to be. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That is to say, God wants us all to come to him. And he's waiting to remake the world for the sake of those who will. And we ask, well, how would God pulling up the weeds cause people to perish? And you know, I can think of a, of a couple ways. The first one is, if God didn't allow evil in the world, we would hate God. We absolutely would. We would hate God because we wouldn't have any choices. If God did what a lot of people who haven't actually read the scripture think God does, which is strike them with lightning bolts if they get too far out of line, we'd hate him. I say that based on my children's favorite ride when, when they were little. Uh, we'd go up to Silverwood, the theme park, and they loved to ride the antique cars, right? Because they could drive them. They could steer them. They could control the gas. You know, the cars didn't go over about five miles an hour. And the reason they could steer them is there was no way for them to get off track. There was this iron rail running down the middle. And you couldn't steer more than about two feet to the right or two feet to the left. And you would bang into that rail. And it would straighten out the car, whether you wanted that or not. Which was really cool when they were toddlers because they could drive this car. Now, how much fun do you think that was when they were teenagers? <laughs> there was no way they were going to go on that ride, right? Because it was boring and tedious. You couldn't go fast. You couldn't possibly get off the road, right? And it wasn't like it was going to teach you to drive in the real world. And isn't that how it would be if God threw a lightning bolt down every time we got more than two feet to the right or to the left, every time we made a bad decision or a bad friend? We'd hate him. We would totally not understand what a gift free will is. We totally wouldn't understand what it means to be made in the image of God. We couldn't possibly love him because we wouldn't be his children. We'd be his slaves. Children have choices. Slaves do not. The other way that it would cause people to perish is this. In uprooting the weeds, he would have to uproot us because there's a part of all of us that's a weed too. I know we don't like to believe it, but even the great saints of the church, renowned for their goodness, acknowledged that within them was what, what the Apostle Paul called the, the old man, the dead person, the, the body of death that we drag around, which is the old way that rebels against God. In this life, we can't get rid of it. So there's the part of us that's made new in Christ, that's led by the Holy Spirit of God, that desires to do his will, and then there's the part that rebels against his will. And every day, we, it's a battle between the two. And sometimes the new life in Christ wins, and sometimes the old dead person wins. And God has to redeem us again and again through Christ. But he does. But that's why he can't just end the world, because he'd have to end all of us. And someday that will happen. But in the meantime, he's patient, not wanting anyone to perish. I've always been struck by this quote from uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, who was a, a Russian dissident, who had turned from Christianity uh, early on in his life, but when he was in a Russian gulag, 
he turned back to the faith of his youth and to a, a trust in God. And uh, he went on to write great books and be freed from prison. And I've always loved this quote. And I think it's really relevant to where we are today. He said, the line separating good and evil passes not through the st any states and not between classes and not between political parties either, but right through every human heart. I know we're in Idaho, we like to think that the line between good and evil separates us from California. <laughs> right? And I know an awful lot of people that think the line between good and evil ha is a line between political parties. That is not scriptural. What's scriptural is that the line between good and evil passes through the human heart. That all of us have the God-given capacity for good, especially those of us who are redeemed and regenerated in Christ, but we also still retain the capacity for evil. So we need to go back again and again, daily, to uh, Martin Luther said it this way, every day you've got to drown the old man in baptism, right? <laughs> I remember that when I get up and take a shower in the morning, got to drown the old man. But here's, here's the ultimate good news, and the final thing I want to bring out, which is God's plan is perfect. That is, God has a plan for evil. And the down payment for our redemption was made by Christ. Although we won't experience the best parts of it until Christ returns. But God has a plan to do away with all suffering, all pain, all evil, all tears. Notice how it's, it's stated. The master says, let both the weeds and the weed grow together until harvest. And Jesus says, so at the end of the age, the Son of Man will send out the, his angels and weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. You notice it's kind of a reverse rapture in Jesus' parable, right? Because what gets pulled out of this earth and pulled out of us is everything that does evil. All the weeds get pulled first, and then the righteous are taken into the barn, right? God will first rid the world of evil and rid us of evil, and then he will gather us to himself. Then we'll be spending eternity with each other and with him and with everything that is good and nothing that is evil. As Jesus puts it, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I want to invite you to stand as we put Jesus' words into the context of the entire Christian faith, the entirety of the teachings that Jesus passed along to his disciples who became apostles, who handed it down to us, and we share these beliefs with believers throughout the world today. So we say to one another, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join our hearts together in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have provided us with so many good things that we enjoy, yet our lives are also full of pain, frustration, and loss. Enable us to better understand your love for us, despite the distance between our problems and your plan. Give us the patience to trust you and your timing as you prepare to remake heaven and earth. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you for the work of Jesus to reconcile us to you so that we can be confident in your grace toward us. Grow our congregation and all your churches in our community and throughout the world so that all people have ample opportunity to know and grow closer to you. Strengthen, protect, and defend those who suffer hardships and persecutions because of their service to you. Lord, in your mercy. Guard our families and friends from all harm of body and spirit. 
Heal those struggling with physical or mental illness. Free those oppressed by demonic forces. Give courage to those struggling with grief or addictions. And defend those who are viciously and unfairly attacked. Guide and preserve those who protect and serve our communities in the medical, military, or public service. Lord, in your mercy. Because you have promised to hear us, we pray especially for the following people and situations in need of your love, healing, and power. Intervene according to your goodwill, Lord, in your mercy. Together we pray for your will to be done. In the words of Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. I invite you to uh, stay standing, if you would, for our closing song. We uh, sing together the old hymn, I'll Fly Away. Some glad morning when this song is over. 